What we're doing today is continuing on the theme of emotions. Emotions is a two-part lecture, um, and we're continuing along certain themes. I want to begin um, by responding to a question which was raised in the last class concerning smiling in non-human primates. It was a very good question. The, the issue was um, we know that humans have different sorts of smiles to convey different sorts of information. The question was do non-human primates like chimpanzees or gorillas or gibbons have the same many sorts of smiles. So I contacted the world's expert on smiling who did not return my emails. So I contacted the second world's expert on smiling who, um, who told me that the answer is no. That, um, that primate, non-human primate smiles actually correspond almost entirely to appeasement smiles. They're don't hurt me smiles. Um, they're equivalent to the coy smile that we saw in humans. Um, but that non-human primates do not use smiles for greetings. There's no equivalent of the greeting smile or Pan Am smile, nor do they use them as genuine expressions of happiness. There's no equivalent to the Duchenne smile. So that's as far as I know. If the world's expert gets back to me and says something different, um, I'll keep you posted. Uh, another thing, going back to the beginning theme of the class, um, what, what we started just to review, we talked about the different functions of emotions. And then we talked about smiling and facial expressions. And then we turned to, some no, to a non-social emotion, the case of fear. And then we shifted to social emotions. And we talked about social emotions towards kin and the special evolutionary reasons that would lead them to evolve. Um, and as we were ending, we were talking about, um, about the relationship between an animal and its children, particularly in cases like humans and birds and mammals, where there tends to be um, a close relationship with our children. We invest in quality, not quantity. Um, I might produce very few children in my life. Uh, and my evolutionary trick then is to focus very intently on them and make sure they survive. If I were to produce 100 children, I could stand to lose a few. But if I just produce five in my lifetime, or two, or one, they become very precious to me. And so um, the story of the evolution of species like us involves a long period of dependence and deep, deep bonds between the parent and the child. And that's part of what I talked about, how parents respond to children. And I want to begin this class by, by giving a, an illustration from a documentary about parental response to children. But I want to give it in a species that's not us. Um, and here's why. I'll, I'll explain why with an analogy. I have a friend of mine who studies the psychology of religion. He studies why people hold religious beliefs. And he tells me that when he's talking to a non-specialist, somebody not in the field, he doesn't ever tell them, yeah, I'm really interested in why people believe in the Bible, or why people light the candles on Sabbath, or why people go to church. Because these are religions that people around here hold. And if you tell people you study them, They'll sort of be puzzled, why would you want to study something like that, or, uh, or offend it. If you want to talk about the psychology of religion to an audience like this, what you do is you start with the exotic. So you start by talking about people who, um, who put butter on their heads. There's a, a, Dan Sperber talks about a culture where the men put butter on their heads in the summer, and it kind of melts, and that's part of one of the things that they do. Or you talk about, um, about a culture that believes in spirits, or that trees can talk. You say you're studying, they say, oh, that's interesting. I wonder why they believe that. And you use that as a way to look at more general uh, facts that exist even in our culture. You, you use the fact that, that we don't take the exotic for granted as a way to motivate the scientific study of things we do take for granted. And this is, of course, true more generally. This was the point in the William James quote when he talked about things that are natural to us and noticed that some very odd things are equally natural to other species. And it's true, I think, in particular, when we talk about things like the love we have for our children. Um, so one way to look at the love we have for our children, scientifically, isn't to look at it head on. Because the love we feel towards our own children feels sacred, it feels special. But look at it in other species. And so one of the nicest illustrations of this is the emperor's uh, penguin, um, which was, uh, which, whose child care and mating practices were dramatized in a wonderful movie called March of the Penguins. Um, and um, this is interesting because they have this incredibly elaborate and quite precarious system 
of generating and taking care of offspring. So I want to show you a brief clip of the movie to illustrate some parts of this. Um, what they do at the beginning, which is not, which leads up to this, is um, they take a very long trek from the water to their breeding grounds. Their breeding grounds is protect, are protected from the wind and they're on a firm piece of ice so they can hold the whole pack. They do the breeding there and it's there that the eggs are created. So this is where um, the movie begins at this point. March of the Penguins was the second best, second most popular documentary of all time, um, beaten only by Fahrenheit 9-11. And, um, and it, people responded to it in different ways, which are informative when we think about the generalizations you can make uh, from animal behavior to human behavior. Some conservative commentators saw this as um, a, a celebration of family values, such as love and trust and monogamy. Um, some liberals um, who hate everything that's good and true uh, <laughs> responded, responded by saying, well, you had a monogamous for one breeding season. It's a year. Then they go and find another mate. You add it up. It's pretty slutty. Um, <laughs> I think more to the point, people were impressed and stunned by the rich and articulate and systematic behavior that these animals were showing. Plainly, they didn't pick it up from television, movies, culture, learning, schooling, so on. To some extent, this sort of complicated behavior came natural to them. And um, it's understandable that some proponents of intelligent design or creationism pointed to this as an example of, of how God creates things that are deeply, richly intricate so as to perpetrate the survival of different animals. From a Darwinian standpoint, uh, the Darwinian would agree with the creationists that this couldn't have happened by accident. This is just far too complicated, but would appeal to, the, um, the, to this as an exquisite example of a biological adaptation. In particular, a biological adaptation regarding parental care to children, shaped um, by the fact that children share the parents' genes. And so parents will evolve um, in ways that perpetrate the survival of their children. Then there's the other direction, which is how children respond to parents. How, um, how the young ones are wired up to resonate and respond in different ways to the adults around them. And we quickly talked about, about some different theories of this. Um, and I'll just review what we talked about last class. Um, babies will develop an attachment to whoever's closest. They'll usually prefer their mothers, because um, their mothers are typically those who are closest to them, they'll prefer her voice, her face, her smell. Um, it used to be thought that there's some sort of magical moment of imprinting, that when the baby is born, the baby must see his or her mother, and boom, a connection is made. If the baby doesn't, terrible things will happen with attachment later on. This is silly. There's no reason to believe there's some special moment or special five minutes or special hour. It's just in the fullness of time babies will develop an attachment to, to the animal that's closest to it. They will recognize it as, at, a, at an implicit level, at an unconscious level, as their kin. Well, how does this work? How does the baby's brain develop, come to develop an emotional attachment to, to that creature? Well, you remember from Skinner that operant conditioning could provide a good answer to this. And this is uh, known as the cupboard theory, which is babies love their moms because the moms provide food. It's a law of effect, it's operant conditioning. Um, they will approach their mothers to get the food from them. And they will develop an attachment because their mother provides food. And this is contrasted with a more nativist, hardwired theory developed by uh, Bowlby, which claims that there's two things going on. There is a uh, drawn to mom for comfort and social interaction and afraid of strangers. Now, in the real world, it's difficult to pull apart these two means of attraction. Because the very same woman who's giving you comfort and, um, and social interaction is also the one giving you milk. But in the laboratory, you can pull them apart. And that's what Henry Harlow did in the movies you saw last week. So Harlow exposed primates to two different mothers. One is a wire mother. That's a Skinnerian mother. That's a mother who gave food. The other's a cloth mother. 
set up so that she'd be comfortable and, and give warmth and cuddling. And the question is, which one do babies go for? And as you can remember from the movies, the results are fairly decisive. Babies go to the wire mother uh, to eat. As, as one of the characters said, you've got to eat to live. But they, viewed the, the, they, they loved the cloth mother. They develop an attachment to the warm, cuddly mother. They, that's the one they used as a base when they were threatened. That's the one they used as a base from which to explore. OK. And that actually, oh, that's just, I had a picture. Um, and that actually takes me to the, oh, except for one thing. It almost takes me to the end of the question of our emotions towards kin. Um, one question you could ask is, what if there's no contact at all? Now, you could imagine that the effects of how, a lot of people are interested in the question of, the effects of the child's early relationship to adults around him or her, and how the child turns out later. This becomes hugely relevant for social debates like daycare. So for instance, a lot of psychologists are interested in the question, is it better for a child to be raised by a parent, usually a mother, or does it make a difference if the child goes to daycare? What if the child goes to daycare at six months? What if a child goes to daycare at two years? How does this affect a child? The short answer is nobody really knows. There's a lot of debate over whether or not there's subtle differences. And it's deeply controversial. But we do know that it doesn't make a big difference. We do know that, that if, um, if you got raised by mom, or perhaps mom and dad, or maybe just dad, all through your life until going up for school, and I, my parents, threw me in a daycare at age three months, um, it's not going to make a big difference for us. Maybe a subtle difference, though it's not clear which way it would go, but it won't make a big difference. But what if there's no contact at all? What, if, um, what about terrible circumstances where people get no cloth mother? They get nobody for attachment. This is a really, in a real world, of course, you can't do experiments on this. And in the real world with humans, this only happens in tragic cases. Um, but this has been studied. Um, so, so Harlow, again, raised monkeys in solitary confinement. So they were, they were um, raised in steel cages with only a wire mother. In other words, they got all the nutrition they needed, but they got no mothering. It turned out that, um, that you kind of get monkey psychotics. Um, they're withdrawn. They don't play. They bite themselves. Um, they're incompetent sexually. They're incompetent socially. They're incompetent maternally. In one case, one of these monkeys raised in solitary confinement was artificially inseminated. Um, when, she, um, when she had a child, she um, banged its head on the floor and bit it to death. So, you need to be, you need, this shows, this is kind of a stark demonstration that some early connection, some early attachment is critical for the developing of a primate. Um, obviously, you don't do these experiments with people, but there are natural experiments. Um, humans raised in harsh orphanages with little social contact. And, um, and these children, if the, if the, in other words, they get fed, barely, but nobody picks them up and cuddles them. Um, these children, if this happens for long enough, um, they end up with severe problems of social and emotional development. Um, from an emotional point of view, they're often insatiable, like they really need cuddling and support, or they're apathetic. They don't care at all. Now, there's some sort of good news, which is if you get these people or these monkeys early enough, um, you can reverse the effects of this bad development. So there's some research done um, with monkey therapists. So they, what they do is they take the monkey, they raise it in a steel cage, the monkey comes out, the monkey's kind of psycho, and then they send in a younger monkey who's just goofing around, jumping all around the place and, and, and everything. And experience with this younger monkey who just follows them around and clings to them um, leads to gradual improvement. It makes the, the, the solitary monkey become better. Um, 
There might be a similar effect with humans. So one story, more of, a, of an anecdote than an experiment, was a situation where at the age of one and a half, uh, children were taken away um, from a really harsh orphanage where they had no contact and brought into a home for mentally retarded women, where these women gave them plenty of contact and cuddling, and apparently, from what we know, brought them back to normal. And this is all I want to talk about, about the emotions we feel towards our kin, towards our children, and towards our parents. Um, any questions or thoughts? <coughs> yes? Uh, do children in orphan centers uh, comfort each other? Um, it's a good question. Do children in orphanages comfort each other? Um, I don't know. The situation probably wouldn't be there. The problem is children in orphanages who are in these terrible situations then be babies and very young. And they wouldn't be thrown together in situations where they could comfort each other. It's a really interesting question. What if it was a situation where children were raised without a supportive cloth mother at all, without being able to pick them up and hold them, but they could play amongst themselves and support each other? I don't know the answer to that. Yes? yes? Is there evidence on that? Yes. Um, the answer is there is evidence, <laughs> as, as everybody knows, um, that, um, that this sort of amongst the, the, the young support can actually help the monkey and the children. Somebody else had a question here? Yes. Right, so this is, this is the question is, what does that tell us about the middle ground? So this is an extreme case. But what do we know about the middle case? Say your parent, you're not raised in a cage, you're not in a Romanian orphanage, but your parents just don't pick you up very much, they don't love you very much. Um, there's no good evidence that that has any effect on a person. The problem is, and we're going to talk about this in much more detail in a couple of weeks, is it's true that parents who aren't affectionate have kids that aren't, that aren't affectionate. But it's not clear this is because of a genetic connection or an environmental connection. The one thing we do know is that in the middle ground, effects tend not to be dramatic. So when you get away from extreme cases, effects are hard to see and require careful experimental research to tease out. I think what it's safe to say for, a lot, for everything but the severe conditions is we don't know what kind of effects there are. But if there are effects, they are not big and dramatic ones. OK. <coughs> animals' good feelings, animals' emotional attraction to their kin is not a huge puzzle from an evolutionary point of view. Evolution is driven by um, forces that, that operate on the fact of how many genes get reproduced and replicated uh, among your descendants. So it makes sense that animals would be wired up to care for their kids. It would make sense that kids who are wired up to survive would develop attachments to their parents. What's more of a puzzle, though, is that animals, including humans, seem to have exquisitely complicated relationships with non-kin. In particular, animals are nice to non-kin. You are nice to people that you're not related to. A lot of examples of this. Um, animals groom one another. You know, you go, you pick off the, the lice and the bugs off your friend. They pick it off you. Um, they, um, they give warning cries. So um, warning cries, all sorts of animals give warning cries. Um, you are, um, I don't know, you're like a little animal and a big animal comes charging. You say, hey! You know, oh, you made some sort of cry and everybody runs away. That's very risky for you, um, but you do it anyway, often to protect people you aren't related to. Um, often animals share child care. And from a cold-blooded natural selection, survival of the gene point of view, you would imagine that, you know, if you lend me your kid for today, I would eat him for the protein. And, you know, it's not my genes, and actually it gives more, more for my kids. That's not quite how it works, though. Animals share food. In fact, that animal, you know, hugely ugly, 
the vampire bat shares food. What happens is the vampire bat, um, vampire bats live in caves and they fly out. And what they do is often a bat will strike it big. So find a horse, for instance. Bite the horse, pump in tons of blood, and then fly back. And what it does is it doesn't keep it to itself. Rather, it goes around the whole cave and vomits blood into the mouth of all the other vampire bats. So everybody benefits. Isn't that nice? <laughs> now, what you're tempted to say is, well, that's really nice. Everybody benefits. But this raises a puzzle from evolutionary point of view. Remember, um, animals benefit um, more. Under this situation, benefits, animals benefit more by working together, by working alone. The benefits outweigh the cost. This is known as reciprocal altruism, meaning my behavior to you, my good behavior to you, my altruism for you, um, is predicated on the idea of reciprocation. I'll benefit from you. And you imagine how vampire bats, for instance, why this makes sense. Um, this is a, if you're a vampire bat, it's a better system when anybody strikes it big to feed you, rather than for anybody to strike it big, use the blood and then spit out all the rest of it. But here's the problem. Here's why it's such a puzzle. The problem is the existence of cheaters. And in economics and sociology, these are also known as free riders. And what a cheater or free rider does is it takes the benefits without paying the cost. Imagine two genes. Imagine one builds a vampire bat that accepts blood from others and shares blood. The other gene accepts blood from others and doesn't share blood. In the long run, B will actually outproduce gene A. Because in fact, B will be healthy while other vampire bats get sick. And, um, and then so the offspring will do better. Um, an even sharper example is an example of warning cries. So gophers give warning cries when there's a predator. It is extremely adaptive to give a warning cry. Sorry, it's extremely adaptive to, to respond to a warning cry. You hear a warning cry, yeah, oh, crap, you run away. It is not very adaptive to give a warning cry. A really good solution then is to, ex to listen to warning cries, but not to give them. You know, suppose we had a system, um, it is very adaptive when people are going to the bar, when people buy drinks, to accept the drinks. It is not so adaptive from the standpoint of one's wallet to buy people drinks. Here's a solution. Accept drinks, but don't pay for drinks. And if everybody fell to that solution, the idea of buying around would fade. So there's the puzzle. Since cheating, since a cheater in the short run can always outwin, does better than a non-cheater, how could this cooperation evolve? How could it be an evolutionarily stable strategy? And the answer is cheater detection. Um, reciprocal altruism can only evolve if animals are wired up to punish cheaters. Now that requires a lot of mental apparatus. You have to recognize cheaters, you have to remember cheaters, and you have to be motivated to punish cheaters. Um, and not every animal has this degree of complicated apparatus, but actually we know um, that vampire bats do. So in one clever study, so, the, so the, the theory says, the evolutionary theory says, yeah, I see what these vampire bats are doing. But you see, and this is a case where evolution makes a nice prediction, that couldn't evolve unless bats are keeping track. If bats aren't keeping track, then the system could never exist because the cheaters would just take it over. They must be watching for cheaters. So the experiment which was done is you, a vampire bat strikes it big, it flies back, and then you keep it, as a scientist, you keep it from giving blood to anybody else. Then what happens? Well, what happens is when the other bats strike it big, they starve the, the selfish bat. Just as if we go to bars and everybody buys around, except for me. And this happens over and over and over again. Pretty soon you're going to buy a round, but you're not going to give me one. And so just as humans are keeping their eyes out for people who are taking the benefits without paying the costs, so are other animals. And it is argued that this sensitivity to cheating 
this, this focus on recipro reciprocation um, plays a powerful role in the evolution of social behavior and the evolution of social emotions. And the classic illustration of this um, is the prisoner's dilemma. Now many of you, I think, have seen the prisoner's dilemma in one course or another. Um, it shows up, it is one of the main constructs in the social sciences. It shows up in cognitive science, psychology, economics. Yeah, you could, um, the teaching fellows are passing around something which you're not going to use right away. But for some of you, this is the first time you're going to be exposed to the prisoner's dilemma. So let me spell it out. Here's the idea. You and a friend commit a crime. You rob a bank, for instance. For the sake of this example, you are prisoner too. You get caught. The police put you in a little room and they say, we want to know everything that happened. In particular, we want you to rat out your friend. Now, here are the options. And one thing about this is nothing is hidden. The police officer could actually print out a copy of the prisoner's dilemma and put it right in front of you. And what he could say is, look, um, you're a prisoner too. You could cooperate, um, with you, you have two options. You could either cooperate with your friend, um, you could stay silent, or you could defect, or you could squeal. But the police officer says, look, um, if you, let me tell you something. If you um, cooperate with your friend and he squeals on you, you go to prison for life and he'll walk, it, walk out. However, if you squeal on him and he cooperates, he, he keeps quiet, he'll go to prison for life and you'll walk out. So what do you do? Now, on the nice side, what you can do is you can say, no, I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to cooperate. Now, if you could trust your friend to cooperate, you're fine. You each get a little stint in prison. But of course, your friend might defect. Your friend might squeal. Here's, here's the important structure of the prisoner's dilemma. No matter what, you, what your friend chooses to do, you're better off squealing. So suppose you're a prisoner too. You believe your friend's going to cooperate with you. He's not going to give the information out. Well then, your best thing to do is squeal on him. What if you believe he's going to squeal on you? Well your best thing to do is squeal on them. But if you could get your act together and you could coordinate this, you would both be quiet and get a fairly minor penalty. And you could see this. This is the standard origin of the prisoner's dilemma, why it's called a prisoner's dilemma. Um, but you can see this all over the place. So here's the logic. The best case for you is to defect while the other person cooperates. The worst case is to cooperate while the other person defects. Back to the police thing, the best case for you is to give up all information, the other guy stays silent, you cut a deal, you walk home that day. The worst case is you're quiet, he cuts a deal, you go to prison for life. But overall, the best is that each cooperate, and overall, the worst for both is if each defect. And the reason that makes this tragic is this. Regardless of what your opponent does, it pays to defect. But if both people defect, both are worse off. I'll give a couple of other examples. Oh, that's just to show that there's a cartoon corresponding to the prisoner's dilemma. It is that common. Here's the idea. I, um, I break out with my wife. We, we've been married for a while. We've decided we're not going to go, go through it together anymore. And we break up. We're living in separate houses, and we're starting to talk divorce. It occurs to me, here's me. I put that as me. Should I get a divorce lawyer, I ask. Now, I know divorce lawyers are really expensive. And it's kind of difficult to get a divorce lawyer. But if I get a divorce lawyer, and so neither one of us get a divorce lawyer, we'll just do OK. We'll get a mediator. We'll split the money down the middle. That'll be OK. But I'm kind of tempted. If I get a divorce lawyer, and she doesn't, and she doesn't, my divorce lawyer will take everything she got. I get everything. She loses everything. Maybe I should be nice. Hold it. 
What if she gets a divorce lawyer and I don't? Well then, I'll lose everything, she'll get everything. Well, we should both get a divorce lawyer then. But we both do pretty badly. Imagine we're two countries, country A and country B. Should I nucle do nuclear disarmament? That's pretty good. We do okay if both countries disarmed. You know, we'll live our lives, you know, we'll raise taxes, we'll do whatever countries do. But wouldn't it be cool if I build up my weaponry and they don't? I'll invade, take everything they got. That's kind of tempting. Uh-oh. Also, if I don't do anything and they do it, they'll invade my country, take everything. So we both build up our weaponry and we both do pretty badly. Once you start thinking about things this way, um, there's no end to the sort of notions that could fall under a prisoner's dilemma. Um, a good example is a drug deal. Suppose I want to buy uh, marijuana from you, or, um, or reefer, as they call it on the street. <laughs> um, so, so, I have $1,000, and from you I'd like to buy a ton of reefer. So, I'm rounding up. Um, so you say, wonderful, wonderful. Let's meet behind the gym, two in the morning, on Friday, and we'll do the change. You bring $1,000, I bring the reefer. Oh, cool, okay, good. And I think, that's pretty good, 1,000 bucks, I get the reefer, get 1,000 bucks, that's really, that's okay, that's the normal thing. But now something occurs to me. Nobody's gonna go to the cops if things go badly. So instead of doing, bringing the money, why don't I just bring a gun? You come with your reefer, I stick a gun in your face, take the reefer, go home. Maybe I won't do that. But now I worry, because you're thinking the same thing. So you could show up with a gun, stick the gun in the, my face, take the thousand bucks, go home, I'll have no reefer. What will I smoke? <laughs> so we both think this way. So we both show up behind a gym two in the morning with guns. <laughs> well, that's not as bad for either one of us if, if I had, I, you had a gun and I didn't have a gun. But still, we're both worse off than if we could cooperate and just do the damn trade. And so, that's the structure of a prisoner's dilemma. You can only appreciate the prisoner's dilemma by actually doing it. So, here's, here is a numerical equivalent to the prisoner's dilemma. Everybody should have a card in front of you, a file card. If you don't, if you didn't get a card, a piece of paper will do just as well. Please write on one side, cooperate, and on the other side, defect. And then please find a partner with whom to play one game. This is a one-shot game. One of you is player one. The player on the rightmost side from my right could be player one. The other one is player two. Do you each have a partner? If you have three people, you could cluster together and do two and then two. And just think, it is actually best if you've never met or spoken to the person you're about to deal with. Um, and the game is, when I say go, Simply show the person your choice. To be clear, if you are player one and you cooperate, and player two cooperates as well, you each get $3. If you are player one and you cooperate, while well, player two defects, player two gets $5, you get bupkis. Um, and so on. On three, just show the card to your opponent, to your person you're playing with. One, two, three. Okay. How many, how many people in this room, how many people in this room cooperated? How many cooperated? How many defected? Okay. How many people are now five dollars richer? Okay. How many of you got nothing? Okay. 
So you're learning. You're learning that the person next to you is really an SOB. <laughs> now, find a person next to you and you get to play again. And you get to play five games in a row. Play five games in a row and keep score. You just show it to each other, record the numbers, show it, show it, show it, show it. Go, now. Anybody here win $25? Yes, $25? So you... That's $20, $20, $21. Okay. It's good, it's good. This really is a measure of honesty. <laughs> um, Anybody win 20 or more? 15 or more? 15, 14 or less? Anybody do um, five or less? You're a, good, you're a good person. It's good. It's good. You play it at him? Bad person. Um, it, it's, not, it's not really about, about good or bad. Um, there was a great game once. It's a simple game. Um, but there was a great game, a great famous competition a long time ago, about 20 years ago, set up by the great computer scientist Robert Axelrod. And he put together a competition where people brought in computer programs to play this game, to play The Prisoner's Dilemma. And there were 63 competitors. And these computer programs were incredibly, some of them were very simple. Always be nice, always, be, always cooperate, always defect. Some were elegant, prime number solutions and, and prototype responses, genetic algorithms crafted to, 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 to figure out what the other person was doing and suss them out. But the winner, the winner was developed by Anatole Rappaport. And Anatole Rappaport actually died about a month ago um, at quite an old age. A uh, great scientist. What was interesting about this was he was the winner with his program, but his program was also one of the simplest. It may well have been the simplest. It was called Tit for Tat, and it worked very simple. It took four lines of basic code. The first time you meet a new program, cooperate. The first time you meet somebody, be nice. After that, do on each trial what the other program did on the previous trial. This beat 62 others. And here's why. It has certain beautiful features. It starts friendly. Remember, the best long-term solution is everybody's, be everybody's nice. It starts off nice. But you can't, it's not a sucker. If you screw with it, it will, it will defect back on the next turn. It is, however, forgiving. You want to get nice with it? Be nice. If you're nice, it'll, it'll be nice back at you later on. It's also transparent. Nothing complicated about it. And that's actually important. It's not merely that it's not a sucker and forgiving. Um, more to the point, um, it is, um, it is you, you could tell it's not a sucker. And you could tell it's forgiving. And this very powerful algorithm learned to cooperate even in a situation, and, and help, learn to make it out the best, even in a situation where there's a risk of cheating and betrayal. Some psychologists have argued that our emotions correspond to the different permutations on the prisoner's dilemma. We like people who cooperate with us. This motivates us to be nice to them in the future. Much as a tit-for-tat algorithm um, says, if you're nice to me now, I'll be nice to you back. We don't like being screwed with. We feel anger and distrust towards those betrayers. That motivates us to betray or avoid them in the future. And we feel bad when we betray somebody who cooperates with us. This motivates us to behave better in the future. Um, you can break down the cells of the prisoner's dilemma in terms of emotions that they give rise to. I did an experiment last night with my seven-year-old and my 10-year-old. I explained to them the prisoner's dilemma. I didn't give the divorce lawyer example. But, um, <laughs> but and, I, and we gave them a big thing of chocolate chips, and, and the good chocolate chips. We had the good chips, and we had the matrix, and we had them play. 
Now what they did isn't so interesting. But what's interesting is they were furious at each other. One of them, the younger boy, was kept being betrayed by the older boy, <laughs> including tricks like he'd say, okay, let's both cooperate. Okay, okay. And he cooperated. Defect. And, <laughs> and, and the response was anger, though not actually guilt on the part of the other <laughs> one, but, but rage. Um, and we see these sort of things all the time in real life. You're familiar with the prisoner's dilemma, but there's another game which you might not be familiar with. Um, it's called ultimatum game. How many of you have encountered ultimatum game? Okay, some of you. Very simple. Choose a partner is a very simple game. When economists study this, they actually do this with real money. I do not have real money to let you do this to. Um, one of you is A, one of you is B. The one on the right most from this side is A, the other one is B. Here's a very simple rule. I'd like A to turn to B and make an offer. A has $10. You can give B any amount you choose from that $10, from $1 to $10. B can do only one thing. B can accept it. If you accept it, you agree to take home the money, and A keeps whatever's left, or reject it. If you reject it, you get nothing. Nobody gets anything. Everybody clear? So A is going to say, I'll give you so-and-so dollars. B will say, okay. In which case, B walks away with so-and-so dollars, or um, an A walks away with whatever rest. Or B could say, reject. In which case, nobody gets anything. So this game cards in two steps. The first thing, I'd like A to turn to B and make your offer. Don't, B doesn't do anything yet. Make your offer. Your offer should be one word. People are explaining their offer. Make your offer. Okay, stage two. Stage two. Do not negotiate. Do not, I see people waving their hands and it's complicated. It should be a number from one to 10, a positive integer. Now, B, I'd like B to say one word. And you could say it really loud on three. Accept or reject. One, two, three. Accept. <laughs> wow. How many people accepted? Anybody rejected? Good. Okay. How many people offered $10? <laughs> How many people offered more than $5? Okay. How many people offered $1? Okay. When you offered $1, did you accept? Yeah. Anybody else offer $1? When you offered $1, did your partner accept? Yeah. Okay. Um, how many people offered either $4 or $5? Okay. Um, this is an interesting game because the person who offered, who accepted $1 was being rational. $1 is better than no dollars. Um, so the psychology of human rationality is such that, that from a logical point of view, you should reason $1 is better than nothing. A rational person should accept $1 and because we're smart, A should offer $1. But not many of you offered $1. Why? Because you know people are not purely rational. People, even in a one-shot game, won't accept unfair distributions. They'll reject them just out of spite. <laughs> and so, you need to offer more. And this has been studied from a neuroeconomic point of view, which basically provides neuroanatomical evidence that people, if you offer them one dollar, they get really pissed. <laughs> Nobody likes to be offered a dollar. Now, there's a more general moral here, which is actually an interesting surprise of some relevance to everyday life. A rational person is easily exploited. A rational person's responses to provocations, to assaults, will always be measured and appropriate. If you know I'm rational and you're in a sharing situation with me, you could say to me, hey, here's a dollar. Hey, Mr. Rational, a dollar's better than nothing. 
okay, because I'm rational. Um, similarly, you could mess with me because you could like harass me in all sorts of ways, take things that I own, as long as you reason that a rational person wouldn't start a fuss about this. There's some advantage to being irrational, to having a temper. Because if you have a temper and you're known to be irrational, people are forced by dint of your irrationality to treat you better. Um, who am I going to take from? The person who's extremely reasonable or the person who has a hair trigger temper? Well, I'm going to I'm I'm pick on a reasonable person because the unreasonable person might do unreasonable things. <laughs> and this is faintly paradoxical, but often to be irrational or at least to have a reputation for mild irrationality gives you an edge. Now this is in focus of provocation, but this has also been presented in a theory of why people fall in love. Suppose you're choosing who to devote your life to, and it's a matter of huge trust. We're going to raise kids together. It's very important for you that I don't leave. And I'm very rational. So I say to you, we should mate and have children because I find you the most attractive of everybody who is available that I've met so far. <laughs> I'm very rational, and as so long as this continues to be the case, we'll be together. Well, that's reasonable and rational, but wouldn't you rather be with somebody who's head over heels in love? Head over heels in love is irrational, but it's also, within certain parameters, endearing, because the irrationality of the person means you could trust them more in the long run. Just like the irrationality of somebody who has a temper means you don't mess with them as much. The studies have been done more with regard to violence than with love. And in fact, the irrationality, the, the benefits of irrational violence um, have been translated in terms of um, the study of homicide and other crimes. Uh, Daly and Wilson describe the cause of murder. Most murder is not caused by reasonable provocation. Most murder is not rational in its response. Most murder is generated by insult, curse, petty infraction. But this is not crazy irrationality. It's adaptive irrationality. Daly and Wilson point out, in chronically feuding and warring societies, an essential manual manly virtue is the capacity for violence. To turn the other cheek is not saintly but stupid or contempt contemptibly weak. If I show myself a, a rational person when picked on or harassed, I'll be known as somebody you could pick on and harass. Um, and in fact, it turns out even in the modern world, this is from a New York Times I just picked up a year ago today, um, and the point is that the violence is due to people disrespecting each other or giving a dirty look. And you might think, isn't that irrational? But it's not irrational in circumstances where people live together in an environment where they have to deal with each other over and over again, and often where there's not much support um, by the police, as in the cases they talked about here. What's particularly interesting is this sort of importance of a reputation for violence differs from culture to culture. And I've been talking so far in this class, and in fact, so far in this course, um, about universals, about things that are built in, things that show up across humans and other animals. Um, I want to turn now and end this lecture by talking a little bit about a cultural difference. And it's a psychologically interesting cultural difference with regard to the emotions. And it's built around a difference um, turning around what sociologists call cultures of honor. Um, a culture of honor has certain properties. You can't rely on the law and, um, and it has resources that are easily taken. And sociologists have argued that when those conditions are met, it becomes important to develop a reputation for violent retaliation. That becomes important. Um, examples of culture of honors include Scottish Highlanders, Maasai warriors, Bedouin tradesmen, and Western cowboys. All cases where there's resources such as cattle that are vulnerable and easily taken, but you can't count on uh, calling 911 and having people come help you. But the culture of honor that's been studied the most by modern psychologists is the American South. 
Um, this was settled by herdsmen and traditionally has less centralized legal control. So the sociologists say the American South is more of a culture of honor than the American North. But how do you know? I mean, what does that do? We're, we're interested in this class in claims about psychology. So it took um, Richard Nisbet and Dove Cohen to study cultures of honors and look at differences. And they found some interesting differences. Um, gun laws tend to be more permissive in the Southern, in, in American South than American North. Um, corporal punishment and capital punishment tend to be uh, more approved of. Attitudes towards the military are more positive. In a questionnaire studies, people are more forgiving towards cultures of honor. Somebody insults my woman and I punch him in the face. Um, this is considered less bad in the American South than the American North. There's a higher rate of violence, but only in certain circumstances. The streets of the American South, as a rule, are not more dangerous than the American North. The difference is there's a higher rate of crimes that are crimes of honor. Such as, for instance, if somebody breaks into my house, me shooting him. Or if somebody insults me, me killing him. Now, this is sort of survey studies. So Nisbet and Cohen did one of the more interesting psychological studies I have ever heard of. And they did this at, um, just, sorry, this is Nisbet and Wilson. They did this with University of Michigan undergraduates. Um, they did a subject pool thing, like you're doing now. And on it, your demographic information was listed. And what they did was they took white males who are not Hispanic and not Jewish. That was their sample. Culture of honor is a phenomenon limited to males. And they wanted to make a sort of a clean study, so they wanted to focus, get a homogeneous sample, so not Hispanic, not Jewish. And they provoked them. And the provocation was genius. What they did was they said they brought people into, into the psychology building, as you'd be brought into Kirtland or SSS or Dunham. And they said, they had somebody go in, there's a desk, and they said, uh, yeah, go down the hall for the experiment. There's a hallway. And then you walk through the hallway. And walking the other direction at that moment, a graduate student, a male graduate student would start to walk. And he's holding some files. And what he does is he bumps the person. Looks at him and says, asshole. <laughs> and keep walking. Now, to be fair, the graduate student survived <laughs> bumping into like hundreds of males, calling them assholes, and then, and then walking through. Fights did not break out. Nobody was shot. But then they brought the men, now went into a room, and they were tested. And it turned out that, um, that there were differences in the stress response. On average, um, males from the American South showed higher hormone response and stress response than males in the American North. Increases in testosterone and cortisol. Um, there's also differences in later behavior. Um, the, the people suggesting that they were made angry. Um, they gave differences in fill-in-the-blank questions, for instance. Um, you know, I, I don't remember the examples, but it's examples like, uh, like John went to the store and bought a blank. And then, and then you know, and the, the Northerners would say, and bought, you know, an apple. And the Southerners say, an AK-47 <laughs> to kill that freaking graduate student. Um, now, again, the American South, people in the American South were not overall more violent than the American North, but they were more sensitive to provocations of honor. Now, when I gave this lecture a few years ago, um, a Southern student uh, contacted me afterwards and said that, that she felt that picking out the Southern minority at Yale was to some regard offensive, and that people say things at Yale about Southerners, American Southerners, that they would never say about any other minority group. So there's two points I want to make regarding this. One is, of course, these are average differences. Um, not every northerner and southerner would differ along these lines. But another one is, I think the effect is real, but it's not entirely clear that it reflects poorly on the cultures of honor, as opposed to other cultures. So Nisbet, for instance, is himself a southerner, and he points out that, that when he went to the north, he was most astonished by how rude people are. And this is because the North, the American North, is not particularly a culture of honor. Um, and, so, and so there's less proper behavior towards other people because there's no fear of retaliation or response. Um, moreover, um, the culture of honor, honor virtues 
like um, honor, loyalty, courage, and self-reliance are on the face of it not necessarily bad things. In any case, um, this is an interesting example of how there's an evolutionary background, um, but culture modifies and shifts it in different ways. More generally, um, I've suggested over the last couple of lectures that emotions like fear, the love you have towards your children, anger, gratitude, are not aberrations or noise in the system. Rather, they're exquisitely complicated motivational systems that are crafted to deal with the natural and social environment. Um, and we know this only from an analysis that starts from an evolutionary approach. So to bring us back to Darcy Thompson, um, everything is the way it is because it got that way. And your reading response for this week is, is that. And, um, and I wish you good luck on the exam on Wednesday. I'll see you there.